16, it's going to be the only reference Bible that doesn't attack the book ever. It's the only one you're going to find. And it's going to be on a doctrinal viewpoint, yet there's a lot of spiritual application Throw it in the notes. And uh, it's, I'm starting to try to count the references, how many there are. Uh, and it's got common sayings in it, where you locate common sayings in the Bible. And so uh, it's going to be, uh, I think, uh, it's going to be, it's designed for the common man. That's what I'm going to call it. The common man's reference Bible. So to give the common man any uh, weapon that he needs when a scholar comes along and shows him this verse, right at that verse there's a footnote to show that scholar is ain't, he ain't a scholar. Shows he's a faker. And uh, so it's been a tremendous blessing uh, to go through it like that. Matthew 15 uh, is the heart of the book of Matthew. It is the uh, right here is where you can see exactly why the Pharisees get mad at Jesus and why they want to kill him, Matthew 15. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for a blessed book you've given us. And Lord, I do pray that you'd help us to understand your word. I pray you'd give us insight, help us to see how you did things, help us to be like you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, remember the Gospel of Matthew shows Jesus Christ is the King of the Jews. The major doctrine in the Bible is a throne. Jesus Christ is supposed to be on the throne. Okay, in Matthew 5-7, through 7, he gives the constitution for his kingdom. In 8 and 9, he gives his credentials. In 10, he calls his followers, his 12 apostles. In chapter 12, the Jews officially rejected Jesus as Messiah. They committed the unpardonable sin. Okay, from then on out, uh, the Lord will speak in parables, Matthew 13. And he speaks in parables so that people of a humble mind and a humble heart understand what he's saying, and the, all the others, it just blows over their head. In Matthew 15, he says something so hot and heavy that he gets the script. Uh, I was trying to get scribes and Pharisees out together. <laughs> I washed my mouth out of soap and can't do a thing with it. <laughs> uh, you got to be careful about this tongue sometime. In fact, several years ago at Cornerstone, we had, uh, Janet knows the story. <laughs> they, they always were trying to, you know, pass out hot dogs, get a big crowd. So through February, every Sunday, the theme was have a heart, have a heart, have a heart. So I'm waxing eloquent Sunday school class. Have a heart, have a heart, have a heart. At the end, it slips. Have a fart. I mean, it, you know, the tongue. Just You mess it up. Just tongue. And from then on, the guys just busted up laughing. I said, okay, forget it. Just close your Bible. We're done. There's nothing I was going to say that they were going to remember anything else. I'd done lost it. <laughs> was it... Uh, uh, Oliver B. Green was preaching about Jonah and the whale. And uh, he was talking about Jonah being in the, in the welly of the bail. And he said, now I, what I meant to say is Jonah was in the welly of the bail. <laughs> and he stopped again for the third time and said it real slow. And he said, well, Jonah was in the welly of the bail. <laughs> And then he said, he was down there somewhere. <laughs> and that's funny. But isn't the mind funny how that works? Okay, the scribes and Pharisees, what he says to them upsets them so bad, at this point of Matthew 15, they want to kill him. So let's see what he says. Matthew 15, 1. Then came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders. Make sure you pick up that word. The tradition of the elders. For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Oh, man. Okay, now where is he doing this at? Okay, the cross-reference. If you have a cross-reference here, you probably have Mark 7. 
Everybody got that? Mark 7? Okay, good. Uh, this is the other account. Same story, different author, Mark. Now, we, we, we may want to flip back and forth between these. Okay, when did they ask this question? They're sitting at a meal asking their question. Sitting down to eat. It's obvious that they're doing that because they're asking the disciples they didn't wash their hands. Now, this washing of the hands is a ceremonial thing. It's not technically talking about eating with you know, dirty fingers. If, if you can't eat with dirty hands, uh, well, your boys would probably starve to death. You know, growing up, you know, working out in the field, you know, the grease mixed in with the sandwich, you know, it just gave it, you know, more, it made it slide down better, I guess, the grease on the hands. <laughs> okay. And grease in computers, is there? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right. He's a good car man, too. Okay, so uh, this is a ceremonial thing. Okay, they're at a meal. Can you imagine this? Got to, you have you know some regular common folks at, at the table, and they're all they're pretty much reclining because that's how the Jews would eat, couch type situation. The Lord there, some of his disciples, maybe all of them, I don't know, probably a pretty good crowd. Maybe it's a potluck, I'm not sure. Uh, you got Doctor Doctor Snodgrass there and Doctor Dry, Dry as Dust there. You know all the scholars. Collars turn on backwards. And they see the disciples, you know, maybe they come from a fishing trip. Can you imagine coming from a fishing trip? And they didn't wash their hands. Mike Pearl, if you read that one article he had in there, it was real funny. Where he and the boys, the boys were real little. They were coming out from fishing out in the swamps. And these college kids were gawking at a little snake on the road. And they said, oh, admiring this snake. And here comes Mike Pearl, you know, just terrible looking from out in the swamps, his two little boys. And they're looking at the snake. And they look at him. And then he looks, oh, look at that snake. And starts talking about it. He said to his, one of his little boys, grab that thing, let's get out of here. So the little kid just grabs it and they just walk in the college. He's like, who is this monster that came out of the woods? <laughs> Well, can you imagine? That's what these guys are doing, okay? And one of these guys pipes up and says very piously to Jesus, Master, your disciples didn't wash their hands according to traditions. And the Lord says, you didn't wash your heart. Pass me the salt. Oh, man. Your tradition stinks, he's saying. That's quite a slam. That's quite a slam. Now, most Protestant schools will claim that their final authority is the Bible. Well, that's what they claim. Which is a good statement, but most of them don't believe it. Now, the Catholics teach that their authority comes from the Bible and tradition. There's nothing to hide. That's what they say. The Bible and tradition. So you ask them, Okay, what do you do when they conflict? And they will come back and say they never do. And I look at them and say they don't. The Bible says call no man father upon earth. Tradition says call Father Flanagan. Now, if that ain't a contradiction, I don't know what is. They say, oh, you don't understand it. So, the Knights of Columbus is, is the, a group of businessmen in the Catholic Church who spend their time trying to teach all the contradictions, try to clear them up. Boy, they're very busy. Because it's just loaded with contradictions between tradition and the Bible. If you get a little pamphlet on the purgatory about the Catholic Church, I've got it. First or second paragraph, it will say, the Bible doesn't say anything about purgatory, but the church teaches it. I would think if the Bible doesn't say anything, why teach it? Well, it's tradition. It's tradition. Okay, so the Lord is saying your tradition stinks. Your tradition contradicts the Scripture. Verse 3, why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, honor thy father and mother. Okay, that would be Exodus uh, 20, verse 12. 
And he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. Okay, that's Deuteronomy 27, 16. Also Exodus 21, 17. Also Leviticus 20, verse 9, Proverbs 20, verse 20. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, that's all right in there. Okay, uh, he's quoting scripture. Verse 5, but ye say, whosoever shall say to his father and mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you, command, you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Okay, now when Jesus said, verse 4, here's what God says. He quoted two verses in the Bible, Old Testament. In verse 5, when he says, but you say, but ye say, now he's referring to what is called the Talmud. That's what the Jews go by today, Talmud, T-A-L-M-U-D, Talmud. Okay, and the Talmud is nothing but a commentary on the scriptures. It's not the scriptures, it's a commentary on the scriptures. Most Christian colleges read books about the Bible but they don't read the Bible. That's what the Jews are doing today. They're reading a commentary about the Bible, the Masoretic text. They're reading the Talmud, which is a commentary on the Bible, the Masoretic text. So they're getting leftover food. It's like a little bird. You Some of these mama birds, they take the bug, they go out, catch the bug, chop it up, you know, chop it up, bring it in, put it in a little sack, then they bring it to the little babies, and they, you know, you come here, they get the second chance. You know, that would sound real appetizing, but that's how they do it. Okay, that's the difference. Now today, same thing going on. Same thing going on. In fact, it's very interesting when you get in a law class, you'll find the same thing goes on in law. Congress passes a, a law. It says, be it enacted. The laws are put chronologically. But it's hard to figure that out chronologically. Then they hire lawyers who are called codifiers who put the law in a code according to subjects. And when they charge you with something, when a policeman charges you with something, he charges you with the code. But if you look up the code, at the bottom of the code, it would say public law such and such. What are they charging you with? They're charging you with a commentary, but not the law. That's a counterfeit. See, and that's how they do that. And that's, that's not right. If it does, Indiana Constitution says every law has to begin, be it enacted. It doesn't say that in Title IX. That's all the, the car stuff or vehicle stuff. So we see the same thing in law as we see in Bible. So I tell you, you have a great advantage to pick up on law real fast just because you know the King James issue versus the NIV issue. That is a great advantage to pick up on these things. I'll give you a, a little a couple of little tasters. Uh, you ever see the dollar sign with the S and two lines? That's the right way. You ever see the dollar sign with one line? That's the counterfeit. The two lines, the S with the two lines appears to be, the two lines coming down, appears to be where it's crossed at the bottom to form a U or a U-S. Two lines. Reference to actual money. The one line is a counterfeit. That's a Federal Reserve note. You'll notice the computers, that's what they have. See, and that's... Now, if you know the King James NIV issue, you can pick up on that real fast. Example. A citizen of the United States is different than a U.S. citizen. One is a real McCoy, one is a false. You say, which one's right? Ain't telling you. That's in the class. See, or you have the Supreme Court of the United States or the U.S. Supreme Court. Two separate things. How about this one? United States Post Office. U.S. Postal Service. One is a corporation that it costs 37 cents to send a letter, one ounce letter. The other is a legitimate constitutional office in America that you can send a one cent or a one ounce letter for two cents. So have you done that? Yeah, lots of times. 
How many pay your bills with two cent stamps? Jim, do you do that? <laughs> They're sending them back now. Okay. Some of them send them back opened up, and them boogers are going to get sued for that. So we're going to investigate that. Very interesting thing. We have some amazing things. Okay, now what's going on here? What is this now in a Mark passage? Go back to Mark chapter or over to Mark chapter seven. <clears throat> And this same thing is mentioned. Let's see if it's got Corbin mentioned. Oh, yes. Mark 7, 11. Now, in Matthew, it doesn't say what's actually going on here. In Mark, it gives a little bit more information. Mark 7, 11. It says, But ye say, if a man say to his father or mother, it is Corbin. That is to say, a gift. By whatsoever ye might be profited by me, he shall be free. Okay, here's, here's what this Corbin thing is. Okay, under the Old Testament covenant, okay, uh, the firstborn child, usually the firstborn, sometimes that is changed by the father. Okay, but the firstborn child receives a double portion of the inheritance. Okay, double portion. What is he supposed to do? What is his obligation when he, because he receives double portion of the inheritance? With that obligation... He is responsible to take care of his aged parents when they have a difficult time taking care of themselves. He is responsible to be the priest of the family, the patriarch. He gets a birthright. Okay, generally that's the firstborn. Uh, now Reuben, he forfeited that right. And Isaac or Jacob gave it to another one. And sometimes gets passed down. For example, in my, in my case, I'm the baby of the family. I am the run. Okay, four siblings. Okay, as far as the Bible would go, the firstborn, my brother, would receive 40%, okay, of an inheritance, my sister 20, my sister 20, me 20. And that's fine. That's right. Now, with that extra 20, the firstborn is obligated to take care of aged parents. Okay, but here's what the scribes and Pharisees were doing. They set up a deal called Corbin. Eight, the firstborn son has inheritance. He sees it's going to cost a lot of money to take care of Ma and Pa. They're really they're in tough shape. He sort of kind of likes that inheritance. He goes down to the priest. He said, uh, here's what I got going on. The priest said, oh, no problem. Give it to the temple. We'll tell your parents that you don't have anything. Uh, then you can put them in a county home and they'll take care of them. And then when your parents are gone, come back to me. We'll give you the money back for a slight fee of a tithe. And then you get the money. That's what's going on. Nice little trick. Isn't that a nice little trick? And the Lord is telling them, you guys are violating the scriptures by your tradition. Your tradition stinks. Tradition is usually designed to keep the religious leaders in the position of authority. That is the real mode of a tradition. They make a lot of money off tradition. Okay, so that's what's going on in Matthew as far as that Corbin thing goes. Okay, uh, any child growing up, when they want to take time to take care of their parents, they ought to want to take care of their parents. It would be a privilege to take care of your parents. Why? They took care of you when you were helpless. Okay, I mean, when you were a baby, I mean, uh, dirty diapers and all that stuff, you couldn't feed yourself. You know, it's amazing, a lot of animals in nature... They're, get, they're ready to go on virtually, in many cases, on their own, right on the spot. Little alligators, when they come out, they've got to watch out for Papa because he's going to eat them. You know, and them little goats, when they're born, they're on their feet. And, you know, 15 minutes, they're trying to get on their feet and even quicker than that. But human infants, they are helpless. They are completely and totally helpless. And so, a child remembers that. And when parents get up in age, they ought to take care of them. I get depressed when I go into nursing centers. I feel sorry for people. Now, I do understand. Some of them reaping what they sowed. They're rascals growing up, and their kids don't want to take care of them. I understand that. 
But I feel I I feel sorry for him. I get depressed when I go in there. One elderly lady, one a couple of years ago. I'd see her every once in a while when I was on there in a service. We'd have it like be a part of the services. And she, she, you know, they, them people get to be guinea pigs from doctors. Cut them up, dope them up. I've seen them take where they take 10 to 15 pills in a cup, drink it down. Can you imagine the chemical reaction? If one of those one of, one of those elderly people don't want have to have enough senses to their mind, I don't deserve to be in here. I don't want to be in here. I can take care of myself. Let me go home. They'll dope them up, calm them down. Make a lot of money off them people. This one elderly lady, she was telling me I could tell her foot was cut off. She said, my toe had a problem. They cut my toe off. My foot gave me a problem. They cut my foot off. My leg gave me a problem. They cut the leg off. I said, don't tell them you got a headache. And I'll whack that off. But they just do that all the time. Just all the time. It's a shame. It's a shame. Kids ought to take care of their parents. Now, very easy to do. Uh, if you like privacy, you want them to have privacy, put a room on the side of your house. He said, cost, mo- cost them. They paid a bunch for us. You know, it don't cost anything. God bless you for that. Children, obey your parents. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land. When you honor your parents, that's when the long life comes in. Or longer, extended. Okay, now back in Matthew 15... Uh, 6, we read that. Notice verse 7. Notice this nice, very gentle, loving comment as Jesus talks to these fellows. You hypocrites. Oh, man. Matthew 15, 7. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts far from me. Oh, boy, is he digging He's pouring into coals. He cut them up, and now he's going to pour in some salt. And then he says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. Can you imagine saying that to somebody? I can remember when we went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. People come into this place, supposedly where Christ was uh, buried. It's inside the city. He wasn't buried in the city. Anybody knows that can read the Bible. And it has a, a marble plate. It has a little thing over top of it. You walk in. You see all these people coming. Here. I'm thinking, man, all the slobber on that. Oh, sick. Gross. Saw two women come in, females. No doubt what they were late at night. You know, I mean, we weren't there late at night, but the way they were dressed, you knew what they were. And they're kissing that thing. You know, I'm stashing tracks around incognito because uh, you do that publicly, boy. And if you're in a tour group, you can you could uh, um, affect the entire group. So uh, I was doing it incognito. But can you imagine standing there and somebody come and kiss that and you say, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. Oh, I need to burn candles. What a waste. I'd kill you over that. Or go to Mecca when all these Muslims are in there, you know, going all this stuff and sitting there. Hey, fellas, you're wasting your time. Come on, you're sleeping anyway. Don't you know you are? You're sleeping, you bunch of liars. They'll kill you over that. The Lord said, you guys are a bunch of vain show. Vain show. Hindus, isn't it amazing? You get these guys, they get their um, hands going like this. Om. Isn't it interesting? The middle two letters of Rome. Om, om, om. Om. They're going to get together. Rome and Hindus. Hitler had them there from Hindu. They found 500, or over 500 uh, Hinduist monks that were killed in Germany. Because Hitler was bringing in the all-seeing eye. 
Hindu priests, what they do is they try to put a, a surgery on them and cut them up into here. And if the surgery is successful, they have, they in essence believe they can see an aura around you with the third eye. This is wacko stuff. Satanic stuff. And if we sit there and say, you're wasting your time to a Buddhist, he's praying all these statues. When we went in that one Buddha pagoda in Vietnam, the, the Vietnam pastor, we knew, he knew some English. And he'd walk past his Vietnamese people and he'd say, stupid, stupid. <laughs> That's what he would say. They didn't know what he was saying, but we knew. And he's, dumb. And you see this Buddhist priest and the guy looks like he's got worms. He's infected with AIDS. He, I, he took terrible. I, we got him on video. I got, made sure I got that thing on video. And he, was a, he had to be a young kid. You look at his eyes. His eyes look very young. But his facial expression, very sad and a very dejected person. And that's a leader of Buddhism? And if we'd have told him, fella, you're wasting your time. Why don't you just, you're wasting your time. And that's what the Lord is saying. Verse 7 and 8 and 9. He said, it's vain. It's vain. It's vain. Praying the rosary. Hail Mary, Mother of Grace. 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 Waste of time. In fact, that's an incantation that brings on devils. That's what that is. Gets them in a hypnotic state. Uh, there are some of these Christian radio praise, uh, stations, you, they'll have a, a Catholic program on it. Used to be one on 11.15. You ever, anybody ever listen to those? You ever listen to those? That gets you in a hypnotic state when you listen to those things. Our Father, Mother, Grace, help us out of our tired need. Our Father, help us out of our tired our need. You know, I hope it comes one of game today. Oh, our and you know, put all that stuff in there and nobody even pick up on it. Now, we can laugh about it, but to those people, that's serious. The Lord says it's vain. It's vain. It's vain. He says it's vain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, verse uh, 10. Okay. Okay, actually, verse 9. Okay, that's all Matthew writes about the account. We'll have to go over to Mark to read a little bit more comments that the Lord says. That, that are downright hateful, it seems like. Uh, in particular, in Mark chapter 7, you have three bombshells in Mark chapter 7 by the Lord. Uh, verse 7, we read that one. That's very similar to the Matthew account. Verse 7. Verse 9 is another bombshell. He said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your tradition. That's a bombshell. Verse 13 is the third bombshell. And then he says, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So they got three whoppers there. After he said that, back in the Matthew account, verse 10... He leaves the situation. Verse 10, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. So that's all he says. So it's like he walks outside of the house where he had this meal. And he says, Come around here, folks. He says, I just want to quote a, a Bible verse to you. And he gives them a scripture which pertains to what happened inside the house. Okay? And then he walks away, starts walking away with his disciples. Verse 12. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Think about that question. Asking God, Did you know? Wait, wait a minute, hold the phone here. You're, I, I know everything. You're asking me, Did I know? <laughs> did you know this, Jesus? Yes. Anything else you'd like to try to tell me? <laughs> he said, Knowest thou? He offended them. He offended them by their, his speech, by his beliefs. What did he say? He answered and said, Oh, I'm sorry. I'll go and apologize. You've got to get that from the Greek. 
That's more a literal translation of the Greek. <laughs> he said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. What a statement. What a statement. Let them alone. Now, according to Titus chapter 2, or 3, Titus chapter 3, verse 10, 11, uh, you give a heretic two opportunities. You can give him more, but after two opportunities, your obligation is fulfilled. Titus 3.10, a man that's a heretic after the first or second admonition, reject. Okay, so we reject him after the second admonition. That's not saying that you should only do two. If, if the Lord's leading and you go further, do that. But don't waste a lot of time, you know, chasing after some rabbits because some of these, these folks ain't going to get changed. Um, Perry McLemore. Some of you know Perry. Um, he and I was talking one time uh, about Mormons coming around. And he, he tries to give them a time of day, tries to talk to them, tries to reason with them. And I'll do that on occasion. Uh, and so we got to talk a bit about it, and I was giving him some things that I've tried. He's giving me some things he tried. And I don't know, he, I think he kind of put more effort into it than I did. Uh, I think he had more of them come over because I was dropping a bomb on him too many times, you know. And I guess a year or two afterwards, he, he, uh, of all the boys he talked to, he got a letter from one that said he got saved and he left the church. But that's rare. That's rare. When you have Jehovah's Witness come to your door, they're not in the mood to listen. They're there to teach. Okay, and the thing is, you've got to get them to really doubt their religion. And sometimes you've got to really put it on them. But don't take a lot of time doing that. Because sometimes these folks will try to interfere with your witnessing to a lost soul. Uh, charismatics are like that. I was trying to witness to a fellow in, uh, in the jail. And it was going pretty good. It was going real smooth. And here comes a pious charismatic down from the other place. You know, he woke up. I don't know what he did. And so he started listening. I'm witnessing this fellow trying to get him, you know, to come to Christ. And this guy interrupts. He just kind of pipes up. Oh, he's, you know, getting a blessing out of it thus far, I guess. He said, oh, you believe in speaking in tongues? I'm thinking, dingling, I'm almost getting this guy saved and you're interrupting me? Where's some discernment? And I looked at him and I said, yes, I do. I don't speak with my ears. And then I went right back to witnessing. He had to kind of think, you know, it buzzed over his head. Do I speak with tongues? Yeah. Uh, you know? Now, it was, an easy, it was an easy fight. I could have tore him up right on the spot, but I would have lost his hold. So you just brush the guy off and go after the soul you were going after. You see, you don't have to win every battle to win a war. It's like the bulldog and skunk fight. The bulldog knows it can win, but it isn't worth the stink. Okay? When you got the Word of God on your side, every time somebody goes against the Word of God, you're on the winning side. Elijah had 450 against him. That was unfair. The 450 didn't have a chance. They didn't have a chance with him because he had God on his side. Okay, so the Lord's saying, there'll be blind leaders of blind. Can you imagine saying that to a priest? You're a blind man? Fellow, you're just as blind as a bat. Well, that, that shakes him up. Shakes him up. Or you can pass out tracks the way uh, Bill uh, Eubanks does when he goes over to the Catholic seminaries <laughs> and all the nunneries he walks in. Hell, Father, hell, Father, gives him track. Hell, Father, hell, Father, gives him track. Oh, praise the Lord, Father, you know all this stuff. <laughs> That's how he does that, and then he gets out of there. <laughs> That's pretty slick. Uh, Nico is always trying to get him to go back to the Vatican with him. <laughs> he won't do it. <laughs> He's scared to death to go back there. Okay, so what's the Lord say? Okay, verse 15. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. Jesus said 
Are ye also yet without understanding? Seems like he's kind of put out with them. Do ye not yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defile not a man. And then paragraph mark. So obviously we can see that generally speaking, a man's mouth reveals what's in his heart. Now I say generally speaking. The reason why you have to say generally speaking because politicians know what to say when the camera's on and the microphone's on. When it's turned off, then you find out what's in their heart. Because by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. But the reason why men cuss in a job and they say blank this and blank that is because they've got a dirty heart. In the Mark passage, Mark 7, verse 21 to 23, it lists 13 sins that come right out of this heart right here in everybody else's heart. Okay, so we can see what the Lord's saying. It's not physical food. It's not dirt on your fingers. It's going to get, you know, ruin you and all that stuff. It's a dirty heart. It's a dirty heart. It's a dirty heart. It's a dirty heart. And he said, you guys, talk, talk, love, talk, love, talk, love, talk me, talk me, talk me. And your heart could care less about me. I've learned that the more a professing Christian say publicly, I love God. I love the Lord. I love God. They're either trying to convince themselves or others because their life doesn't show it. I don't go in around saying to people, I love my wife. I love my wife. I gave her a birthday card this week. I love my wife. My actions should prove that. Now, I tell her and I tell the Lord. But in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 3, it says, If a man loved God, the same is known of him. So when people are always talking about that, they don't know what love's all about. They haven't got a clue. And so the Lord's saying we should draw, draw close to God with a heart. Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd help us to realize we, we know, we know that uh, you search our hearts. We're not hiding anything from anybody as far as uh, we're not hiding anything from you.